All right, folks, why don't we go ahead and get started. Maybe a few folks uh, a little bit late in signing on, but that's all right. Um, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Veronica Buckwalter. I'm a project director with the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. And today's webinar is titled, Understanding and Engaging Student Resistance as Part of Your Internal Early Warning System. Before we begin, I'm going to share some brief details about today's webinar. Today's webinar will last for approximately six, 60 minutes with time at the end for questions. Everyone has been automatically placed on mute upon entry into the webinar, and only our panelists will be unmuted throughout the presentation. Therefore, if you have a question, we do ask that you utilize the chat panel at the bottom right of your screen, and you can feel free to submit questions or comments at any point throughout the presentation. And like I said, we'll be setting aside time at the very end uh, of the presentation to answer those questions. If there are any questions that we don't get to during the 60 minutes, um, we'll take note of these and we'll have our presenter get back to you as soon as possible. Um, we'll try to respond to as many questions as we can um, and encourage, like I said, both questions or comments for our presenter using the chat function. Today's webinar will be recorded. The recording and the slides will be made available to all registrants, and th that will be posted to the National PA Center's temporary website, and I'll be posting a URL to that website in the chat panel so that you have access to that. So today's webinar is one of a number of webinars being offered by the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center throughout 2018. This National Technical Assistance Center was launched in 2016 and is funded by the Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students. The mission of the center is to disseminate evidence-based practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school, and succeed academically so that they graduate high school prepared for college, career, and civic life. The two communities, uh, communities of practice referred to in the center's mission are focused on the 30 national My Brother's Keeper Success Mentor sites and the many eligible schools throughout the country that are working to implement early warning system programs to address chronic absenteeism. Unfortunately, we have run into several unanticipated delays in launching our full web-based technical assistance uh, website, which will be housed on the Department of Ed website. Um, so we have, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've been using this temporary web page, which is this URL you'll see at the bottom of this slide, um, but we hope that our full PA Center website will be up and running very soon, and we'll make an announcement about that uh, to everybody in our network when that happens. So today's webinar is being presented by Dr. Mm -hmm. Eric Sashalis of JFF. Dr. Sashalis is the Research Director of the Student-Centered Learning Research Collaborative part of the Students at the Center initiative at Jobs for the Future. A former middle and high school teacher, union president, and teacher educator with 25 years of experience in public secondary schools, Dr. Tashalis is the co-author of Understanding Youth, Adolescent Development for Educators, and most recently authored Make Me, Understanding and Engaging Student Resistance in School. Both of these were published by Harvard Education Press. So at this point, Eric, I am going to go ahead and turn over presenter privileges to you, and you can lead us through your presentation. Thank you so much, Veronica. Really appreciate teeing this all up so well. Um, welcome, everyone. Excited to be uh, in this webinar with you today. Um, the issues that I'm going to talk about um, are directly related to how systems uh, schools, educators, and communities think about the causes and um, outcomes that can happen in early warning systems um, and to think about what actually drives chronic absenteeism and how we may, in some cases, be contributing, despite our best intentions, be contributing to the factors that uh, lead students to um, skip school or to drop out. Um, so what I'd like to just give broadly at the very beginning is uh, just a few opening ideas about well, the way, the reasons I'm framing this as, a, as resistance rather than framing this about classroom management or framing it about discipline or framing it about misbehavior. Um, I think that resistance, and I think research bears this out, um, resistance is a more productive way to frame behaviors that we see in youth and that we experience as troublesome or as disruptive or as problematic. Um, 
And the reason why resistance is so much more an important way of framing it is that it begs the question at each time we see a behavior that troubles us. Um, and that is, the question is, what might this student be resisting and why? Um, and framing it in this way causes pr uh, professional educators, systems level leaders, state level leaders, and even legislators and community members to think more broadly about how behavior is a symptom of problems rather than often the problem itself. It also orients us towards thinking about the specific practices that we can use to help change those behaviors or in some cases the practices that we need to do differently because we're the cause of those behaviors. And what this could do for us as a shift in an early warning system is not necessarily always, and I'm not saying that we're always focused in this way because many of us of course are not, but it can help shift our orientation to trying to figure out what's wrong with a kid or a family, but instead think about how is this kid's behavior a response to the way that we are educating this particular child and the opportunities we're providing for them and potentially the stressors or the learning environments or the status differences that we're exacerbating by some of our policies and practices in schools. So thinking about student behaviors that we don't like in terms of resistance helps us to name different ways of going about trying to treat it. So all of what I'm going to talk about today um, has a much deeper and broader explanation that is rooted in research and in my experiences as a classroom educator in middle and high school settings and as a teacher educator in university settings and now as a research director working for a large nonprofit. Uh, and it all comes from uh, the, my most recent book, Make Me. So uh, apologies sort of apologies for the shameless plug, but if you'd like to go deeper into this, I spent years trying to make sense of that research and put it in a way that really is accessible to practitioners, policymakers, and systems level leaders. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd love your feedback. If you ever do access even just a chapter of it and have thoughts about it and how you're using it, I would love to hear from you. So let's get into it. So I'm going to do two main chunks of uh, presentations here. One is about classroom level, and then there'll be school level practices that we should be scrutinizing as part of our early warning system development. And this is the short list of them. We're going to go into each one of these in more depth. Homework, how we question students, how we praise students, how we deal with status differences, and how we literally, hopefully not, not literally, but how we figuratively put dunce caps on many of our students, which may compel them to seek other places that are less traumatizing, damaging, and psychologically injurious to them. So let's get into it. One, homework. No doubt every teacher in your school or in your state or in your system has received complaints from students about homework, but increasingly likely from parents and in some cases even from employers and post-secondary leaders. The reason being that homework often functions not as a value add, it actually functions as a tool of segregation. And that may be off-putting to many, but bear with me on this so you can see where this comes from. Homework relegates the student to a position in the afternoon and evening when they are left to their own devices, they're left to their own social location, they're left to their own classed, raced, and gendered situation in their lives, such that some students have a clean, well-lit place to study with a tutor or an adult nearby to help them make sense of it, and many other students have very little of those opportunities. And as a result, homework is a key factor in providing a rich, rich get richer and a poor get poorer sort of outcome for schools. It actually creates situations where students have very little opportunity to keep up with other students who have lots of opportunities. And as such, we need to be thinking about whether homework is an actual value add for many of our kids or whether it's part of the problem. Within homework, I would ask you to think about particularly as we encourage students to come to school, or in some cases, why we may discourage them and they give a sense of hopelessness, is to think about the way that we're assessing homework. If homework is practice, why would we be grading it? Why would it go in a grade book? If it's an opportunity for kids to try something out and to see if they're getting it or not, why would we saying you got a C on that, you got a D on that, or worst case scenario, you got a zero on that? And mathematically speaking, Doug Reeves did a fantastic article about this years ago that many people have cited and looked at for many years, highly recommended. It's called Beyond the Zero. 
But zeros are not holes, or there are, are not blanks in the gradebook. They are actually holes. If we're only grading from 60% to 100% in terms of the bottom D is a 60 out of 100, if we're putting zeros in the gradebook, we're actually taking points away from other higher graded of, uh, um, assignments. And if we do that chronically over time, a kid could literally and, and rightfully say to the teacher, why should I continue to submit work when there's no mathematical chance for any later work that I might do to compensate for the zeros that you gave me when I was trying to practice this thing for you? And so we need to be really careful when we look at how our educators, how our systems, how our software programs that schools are creating in order to report grades that then crank out those seats that get sent home, how are zeros understood in that grading system? How are they arithmetically um, accounted for? And is that an equitable play? And is it helping to encourage students to attend school or is it pushing them away? Another thing, psychodynamically, Homework can be understood as a relational token. For many kids, the little power that they have in school is whether they give or withhold something that the teacher wanted from them. Johnny, I would like your homework. Where is it? And if the student isn't feeling connected to or is feeling aided or is just feeling angry or upset or had a rough day, one way that they can demonstrate that is by withholding something that somebody else wants. That is, quote unquote, shooting themselves in the foot, but it makes sense logically to a student who feels alienated, who feels disconnected, who feels shamed in school, who doesn't feel as smart as others may be. And we need to see that homework is not just a way to account for your learning, but it actually can be understood in psychodynamic terms as a way to strengthen relationships or a way to broadcast to others that you're not feeling good in those relationships. And when we see it in that light, we understand that we may need to change our homework practices. Okay, so for teachers, homework really does need to be understood as practice, and as practice that we should think about it, our assessment strategies and our relational strategies for how we understand it. So a couple of solutions. One, highly recommend that all schools, if they don't get already, be, and I know this because of the way I worked in teacher education in five different teacher education programs across three different states, that many programs do not give a robust uh, explanation of how assessment should be understood, really looking at the math of it, looking at the techniques of it, the difference between formative and summative assessment, and that plays out in the way that we assign homework and create opportunities, create negative opportunities for students to feel alienated and disconnected from school. So one solution would be to focus professional development on assessment strategies at schools and give people, the, give educators the things that they need in order to do that professionally and do it really well. Another solution is just to say, to make it a policy at your schools or your system maybe even legislation if, if it were possible, that nobody gives zeros for a failure to turn in homework. A zero is a whole, it's not a blank. Three, another solution, some schools, many schools have done this, that homework can account for no more than 20% of any final grade in any course. That at least gives kids an opportunity that if they're really failing on the practicing part, potentially because of the poor assessment strategies, that, it, that the worst grade that they can get, if they get an A and everything else is a B minus. And that is one potential solution to diminish the effect that homework can have on kids' sense of possibility. And last would be, to look into and try to implement competency-based forms of assessment and instruction. And there's lots that has been written. I would, I would commend Competency Works and the work that Ina Paul has led. I would send you to the Student-Centered Learning Research Collaborative and the Students at the Center Hub for all of the resources that we've put there about how to implement competency-based learning programs, what it takes, um, how to do it, what kind of outcomes you can expect to see, and then try to go to a school that's been doing it for a while. I've been to many, and I can tell you from personal experience, it is absolutely thrilling to watch kids take ownership of their learning, to come to school to try to get better at something, and to see opportunities to get more and more mastery at something, rather than shying away from opportunities where they feel shamed for not having performed up to par. Really recommend it. It's a fantastic lever for social equity, and it's a great lever for introducing uh, more opportunities for students to feel connected to school and take away opportunities for students to feel alienated. So grading homework, big one. Next one, questioning strategies. Every good teacher knows that we teach through our questions. We also really express our expectations and our favoritism through our questions. 
the bulk of our questions tend to go, if you're a human teacher, they tend to go to the students with whom you have the greatest connection and with whom you have the most trust in their intellectual capacities. If you're like most teachers, you tend to worry about asking questions that would expose students' ignorance. And so you distribute questions across the classroom that create a rich get richer and a poor get poorer sort of phenomenon. You need to ask, we need to ask, and we need to be looking at each other's practices, who gets the lion's share of our best learning opportunities? And if some of the best learning opportunities are provided through really good questions, we need to be analyzing the data in our classrooms to make sure that we can see who's getting the bulk of the best questions and who's most benefiting and least benefiting from that. Who's getting the least sophisticated, the most perfunctory questions, and who's expected to lead the intellectual work in a classroom, and who's expected just to obey the rules. Thinking about our questioning strategies, one of my favorite ways to analyze teaching in a classroom is simply to go in and record every question that the teacher asks during a particular span of time. And then sitting down and analyzing how many of those questions got to a deeper engagement with content area and offered opportunities for students to express their perspective, their cultural location, their beliefs, their hopes, their aspirations, and how many questions were far lower order questions that were just asking for quick answers and quick data in order to move on. The more we can move toward the former and limit the latter, the more we can open the classroom to more inquiry-based forms of learning, project-based forms of learning, problem-based forms of learning, the more we're going to find that students are eager to come to school because it's an opportunity to get better and better at stuff, an opportunity to find out how other people think, an opportunity to connect around questions of import to them, an opportunity to feel like the school is for me and gets me, and we can do that through a better and better questioning. So a solution here would be professional development that gets teachers to see and avoid the typical initiate a question, get a response from a student, and then evaluate it its rightness or wrongness, and then move on to the next one and next one, the IRE model of questioning, which appropriately is pronounced as IRE, because it's maddening for students to only have intellectual relationships with material and their teachers that are based on question, response, evaluation, question, response, evaluation. So doing PD that targets that can be really helpful. Some of the things to include in that PD would be having teachers practice using randomizers in the classroom. They're not simple little tricks. They're actually research, well-founded techniques to distribute the learning in the classroom in a much more equitable and a much more inspiring way. Highly, whether it's popsicle sticks and cups, whether it's an electronic randomizer at the front of the classroom, or you have cards posted on the ceiling and you pull from a card deck, and if you're below that card, it's your turn to answer that one. It's not a stressful situation for kids if it's done really well. It's an opportunity for kids. So I've seen it done well. There's lots of great stuff online you can find about that. Another solution is peer observations. Um, Whenever possible, one of the chief ways that we can change our schools to be more student responsive and also more teacher responsive, and that way more learner responsive, is to make sure that teachers are looking at each other's practices. And if you can get teachers into each other's practice, into each other's classrooms, to just analyze simply, again, like I said, write down the questions that you see, that you heard in the classroom, and then sit down with the teacher afterwards to analyze, are we happy with the level of questions that we're seeing and who got them? That's a great starter. It's fairly low risk, high yield. You get really good input about who's most getting the bulk of the attention in the classroom, who's getting the bulk of the intellectual work in the classroom, which kids might be least inspired, which kids might be withdrawn and backing out, which kids weren't even there that day. Really good to do that. Um, next solution would be student observations. Um, if and whenever possible, get teachers to record data from their primary clients, which is the students. Exit tickets, what worked best for you in class today? What worked least for you in class today? What suggestions do you have for me for making it better? If you just give them index cards and that's their way to get out of class and they just give you that feedback, you do it once a week, you do it once every two weeks, and teachers were to do that as a part of their practice, you're going to learn a lot about from your kids about what's working and what's not. Teachers need to be as cognizant as, and as hungry for data as we want our systems to be. And I think one of the ways to do that is just to probe student uh, 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 perspectives about what's working in the classroom and what isn't. And then to that point, last point, um, there's lots of schools and lots of software programs out there now that provide data dashboards that track student touch points so that you can see I connected with these eight students in this class 
quite a bit this week. Now I haven't connected with these 12 students. Um, in fact, this student is starting to see a lapse in their, in their um, attendance. Uh, maybe there's a pattern that's connected there and you can kind of see those things develop over time. Data dashboards are fantastic ways to organize educators around hard data to help them see where they're really nailing it with some kids and where some kids might be uh, uh, feeling disconnected and alienated. So great takeaways there to potentially use in your system. Um, another practice to scrutinize, this comes from um, the mindset um, scholarship. Um, we need to be really careful with how we praise and reward our students. Um, we know again and again, again, the deeper we get into the research work with uh, mindsets, the more we understand that what students believe about their own intelligence and their own capacity to grow drives so much of what's possible for them in terms of academic, social, civic, and college and career readiness. So we really need to pay attention and get to the beliefs. And by the same token, teacher beliefs drive a lot of student outcomes. So mindsets of teachers and students matter quite a bit. And we need to understand that fixed mindsets, the belief that my intelligence was fixed at birth, there's not a whole lot I can do to change it, and that I'm either this type of learner or that type of learner, those are all myths. Actually, any one of us can get better at anything we undertake at any time if we have the significant resources to do it, we have the time, and we have the effort put into it. It just, we have to unlearn a lot of that stuff. And that means we have to unlearn a lot of the labeling that comes with our schools, who gets to be called honors, who gets to be called AP, who gets to be called GATE who gets to be called gifted, who gets to be called talented, who gets to not be called gifted, who gets to not be called talented. What does that confer onto a whole populations about who is understood to be intelligent, whose knowledge is worthwhile, whose contributions are going to be valued? All of those things can get communicated in and through the labels that we put on our classes, which end up being labels that we put on our students. So we need to get to both the teacher beliefs, the student beliefs, and the institutional beliefs that are conveyed through that. So one solution here would be to take part in many of the for-profit, non-profit, or online for free um, uh, uh, resources about mindset professional development. And there's a lot out there. There's some that are better than others. I'm not going to claim to have gone deep into being able to evaluate those, but there's some really good stuff. The more it's research-based, the more it's their citations that connect to the folks like um, at Stanford and elsewhere who have done a lot of this work, I think it's likely to be more better, um, more better if that's a, if that's a phrase. So be, look into that. But PD is really important and has a, break, a good impact, and there's some good programs that have shown that impact. Another solution would be Practice productive praise with your teachers and repeat it. Here's the thing that I see teachers often trying to make sense of. Instead of saying to a student, uh, praising them for their intelligence, gosh, Johnny, you're so smart, which really has a highly negative effect on Johnny's decisions to apply later effort, um, you, you'll get teachers to say, Johnny, I'm so proud of you. Um, I really like what I'm seeing here. I like this. I like that. That is better than it was before, but that's not getting where we need to go. It's not about what the teacher thinks is good or bad in a student's performance. It should really be about what the student thinks about their performance. So instead of coming in and saying, I want you to praise better, we can just simply, when in doubt, ask students a question about how they got to that level of performance. How did you get there? What strategies did you use? What did you learn? What was your, the most difficult part? What was the easiest part? What are you going to do next? And then after they explain all of those different things, then you can say, I really like the effort that I'm seeing here. I think it's going to pay off for you. That's the kind of praise that builds mindsets, builds capacities, builds engagement, builds students' interest in wanting to come back to school, stay in school, and show their development over time. Another solution is to focus on expectancy value theory, which is a well-researched component in motivation. And really what that suggests is that students, every time they decide to expend effort, they look at their chances of success and how interested they are in that work. And so if we're communicating something that's really difficult and we're showing it's going to be impossible and we're grading on a curve, we're actually dissuading students from applying their effort. And that's even, it's exacerbated even more when the student was never interested in the topic or the inquiry to begin with. So what this suggests for teaching is that we have to sell what we're talking about and what we're just choosing to engage in and investigate in our content areas. And we have to show the students its relevance to their lives. And then we have to show them tangible opportunities and scaffolded ways that they will be successful in it. If you say you're only going to be successful six months from now, that's not helpful. Show them that they're successful on Tuesday. Give them a little win on Wednesday. Give them a little on Thursday. If you wait for a couple days for a win after you've shown those little ones, it's okay, but give them that feeling of traction.
And last would be give them peer observations that focus on teacher-student responses to mistakes. Whenever possible, try to get um, uh, input from students um, and from other teachers um, that help uh, teachers and students to change the way that they think about um, mistake making in a public setting. And keep in mind that what we often ask from students that can be really scary, particularly for those who don't feel like they're the smartest kid in the classroom, is we're asking for them to demonstrate their ignorance in a public setting whenever we give them a tough question or ask them to go to the board or ask them to try something. If at all possible, if we can change the way that we understand how mistakes are beautiful possibilities that show us the next place that we most need to focus our efforts instead of having snickers or eye rolls or any sort of ridicule that can occur in the classroom, that can shut learning down immediately. So really be thinking about the way that we set up praise and the way that we reward kids in school. The rewards should be increased engagement with the teacher, increased engagement with other students, and more and better little, little wins as they're getting to more and more mastery in the classroom with their content area. Another practice to scrutinize is um, the extent to which we ignore status differences in the classroom is highly linked to how many of our students who arrive at school already minoritized, marginalized, and alienated, and their capacity to decide to disengage, to withdraw, to skip school, to be chronically absent. So, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to ignore status differences actually, is, actually contributes to the problem. Our kids' social location shapes to what they can see, what they believe, how they behave, and their orientation to school. And any stigmas or hierarchies are really felt deeply by the students, and they're felt intensely in adolescence. Misbehavior of students who may be troubling the school game by trying to sort of push back when they feel like they might be the dumb one, they feel like they're not the cool one, they're not the wealthy one, um, they're, not, uh, they're not part of a mainstream racial dominant group that gets the most props in our society and is most visible in all of the many media. They may be part of a racial group that is often denigrated in a particular community or in the media. Um, they may be part uh, or subject to racial microaggressions, um, linguistic uh, discrimination, um, and all sorts of things that we know are rampant in our society. We have to understand that ignoring those differences and just trying to see all kids as equal and saying I'm colorblind or all kids are the same or we're all the same inside, that actually it can be experienced as a form of abandonment by many kids. Colorblindness and other similar strategies that many have tried to use to avoid complicity and systemic oppression is perceived as malpractice by many students, particularly those who arrive at school racially or socioeconomically or linguistically or uh, for gender reasons or sexual orientation, they arrive at school already marginalized. So one thing to do about this is to do school climate surveys that include students and parents to find out the extent to which teachers and systems level leaders, building level leaders, are including um, parent and student perspectives um, about the, the extent to which they are, um, status differences are being honored and paid attention to in the classroom, particularly in cooperative learning situations. Another solution would be to really focus in your learning environment at your school level and at your systems level on the issues of whiteness, of racial privilege, and of various forms of oppression. Um, and I know that for many folks that is a, a sticky and, and troublesome and uncomfortable direction to go with PD. Um, I can't underscore enough that that stickiness and discomfort early on is part of the learning. That's what it looks like to get better and better and better and understanding our own social location, our, our own social location and how it brings us various blindnesses and what we can see and how we interact with those that we consider to be other. Um, another perspective would be, another solution would be uh, to think about how you could actually infuse across the content areas, and that includes math and science and PE, um, culturally responsive forms of pedagogy, culturally sustaining forms of pedagogy, and there are a ton of handbooks and online materials and, and articles, and you can go to Students at the Center Hub and get great stuff on this, so you can go to Edutopia and get great stuff there. You can go to various nonprofit organizations who do this. Um, you can go to Dignity in Schools to look at the way that they've created um, whole trainings around uh, reforming disciplinary strategies around culturally responsive techniques. Um, I can't recommend that field enough. It really matters, particularly for kids who don't see themselves reflected in the teacher population at schools and need to see more of that representation. Um, and the last solution that can really help us to 
um, not ignore, but actually to highlight status differences in schools is to uh, create targeted opportunities for marginalized and minoritized students to experience their own voice and to take a leadership in analyzing how the school can be better in serving the needs of minoritized and marginalized students. We know that early warning um, systems are helpful in helping us to see and attend to the students who most need these early supports. And we also know that that's experienced disproportionately by kids who come from low income and high poverty families and students who come from racially minoritized and marginalized groups and students who may be uh, not fall in the gender binary and students who may be experimenting or trying to figure out their sexual orientation or who may know it very clearly. Um, all of those things are really important to give those students an opportunity to express their voice and to take a leadership role in analyzing best practices and communicating um, new directions. And again, lots of opportunities out there. If you just Google student voice, student leadership, the work of Dana Mitra as a scholar, um, there are lots of organizations around the country who have led and can show schools how to do that. Um, really powerful impact that can have, particularly on kids who have felt um, alienated from school. And then the dunce caps. Um, again, this is not new, but it's really worth and important to think about as we think about our kids who are most alienated and who are checking out of school. Um, students, when they're given a choice, will almost always choose being bad over being dumb. Um, we do it as adults. Uh, in teacher meetings, we're the ones that would rather be snarky and rude if we know that trying something new may expose our inexpertise. Um, we do it at Thanksgiving with family when we don't want to be the one around the table who looks dumb in front of other folks, so we decide to be rude or pick a fight with grandpa. Um, adults are no different, but we, we try to preserve our ego, and we'll do that by choosing bad behaviors because at least then we feel like we're in control. Students do the same thing. Performance-based environments can scare students into that actual experience. It can scare them into withdrawing or rising up and resisting. And performance-based versus master-based. Performance-based meaning that we're far too focused on the grade, we're far too focused on the end product, we're not focused on the learning that's happening now and the incremental mastery-based, competency-based processes that occur on the way to that performance. Um, anytime you have unchecked ridicule for someone making a mistake in the classroom, that is toxic to the learning environment, and kids may be taking care of themselves by not coming to school that next day because they don't want that experience again, particularly if it's chronic across classrooms. And I guarantee you, anyone that ever says that we don't have a bullying problem at your school, yes, you do. That stuff is underneath the surface. Bullying is not necessarily something that we can cure overnight but it is definitely something that we can address. Schools are getting better and better and better at it. The key thing to do when you think about addressing bullying problems in schools is to not shame all the students for doing the, for, for participating in bullying, but to really look at the bystanders and empowering bystanders to be the ones that rise up and say, not on my watch, I'm not gonna let you do this, you're bullying this person, it won't happen here. If you focus on a bystander approach, you get really good uh, results there. So the dunce caps, how do we solve that problem? Um, one way is to discontinue all ability grouping at your school. That means getting rid of tracking. That means getting rid of, 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 of um, non-hetero, of homogeneously grouping students and replace that with personalization and competency-based education and significant professional development for teachers who will be laggards and not wanting to go in that direction because frankly, it is easier to teach a tighter, more tightly grouped set of students in a classroom than it is to teach with a diverse and a differentiated group of classrooms. However, that's, that's focusing on the benefits to the teacher that at, the, at the expense of the benefits to the students. Ability grouping has a highly negative effect on those who don't receive the highest accolades of being in the higher groups. It could be, it can function as a dunce cap and it can function as a chief factor and why would I go to school if every time I walk through the door, I'm labeled as dumb or dumber than they are. Not a fun place to be. So you can detract your school, it's been done, it's being done around the country, it is possible, it is amazing. When you go to schools that have done it and you hear about their journey, you see what it can be, how it can be done, really good for kids, really good for communities, really good for teachers. 
Another solution is to make sure your faculty know how to value mistakes and failure by targeting mastery opportunities in the classrooms. And that means really changing the culture, particularly in some of the STEM disciplines, around how we understand the multiple ways to get to an answer and the multiple ways that mistakes can help us identify the next best efforts. Another solution is to prioritize rigor over remediation. Often when a student is struggling, we'll put them in the lower track classes, which actually have less rigorous environments, more perfunctory forms of education, more worksheets, less trained teachers, a less engaged parents, um, and then we sort of uh, kind of track along those lines. When in doubt, whenever you're about to remediate or try to rigor or express more rigor, go with rigor, and then you scaffold accordingly. If you have higher expectations, that means you have to bring higher supports. But trying to solve the problem by putting them in the dumb class and then giving them a poorly trained teacher and then giving them a bunch of we uh, worksheets in order to create sort of a holding pattern, those kids, to my mind, are right to start to look for ways to get out because it's not a place for them to feel smart. It's not a place for them to feel like they're growing. It's not a place for them to connect with others. Last, I would say build motivation and engagement checklists. I have multiple ones uh, supplied in the book, and there's lots of good ones you can find online. When I do professional development for, for um, districts, I often supply for them a, a, par, a, a personalized and targeted set of checklists to look for in their classroom. All this really means is if you know research around motivation and engagement, then to give yourself a self-check once a week. D am I paying attention to students' expectancy value? Am I providing opportunities for kids to learn from each other? Am I connecting with parents and with the parent culture in order to make students feel like school represents me? You look for all these different things, and at the end of every week, you know, on a little sheet, you can kind of check off. Am I doing this? Nope, I need to do more of that next week. And this is a way for teachers to use the checklist to talk about each other's practices. And if I have checks in three columns over here, but not in two columns over there, I look for the other teachers on the faculty who have the checks where I don't, and I ask them how they do that, and then I get new practices. So build those checklists as a school, decide what should go on them, use online resources or books or articles that have done that, and then use that as a way to build more teacher capacity, more learning capacity. Okay, so take a breath. We're switching to school level features now. So now not so much focusing on just the classroom level, but looking full out at school level. And some of this will build on some previous components, tracking, exclusionary discipline, school culture, and faculty diversity. One. This goes back to our mindset uh, topic that we discussed previously. Again, intelligence isn't fixed, and neither are skills. Why would our classes be fixed? Why are we fixed? Why are we fixated on an old model where we understand intelligence to be something you're born with, and all the smart kids go here, and all the dumb kids or the struggling kids go there? Are schools really instruments for social mobility, or are they ways to just exacerbate pre-existing divisions between various hierarchies in our society? I would hope that they're the former and not the latter, but right now I think we have to prove that. Tracking communicates fixed mindsets. It puts dunce caps on students. It puts social stigmas on families. It creates status differences at schools that are acted out in hallways and in locker rooms and at bus stops all the time. And it creates a disproportionate distribution of resources in that teachers who are highly prepared and are, are highly skilled tend to move toward the gate, the uh, international baccalaureate, the AP classes, and the least prepared teachers with the least set of skills tend to move toward the other side of school where a lot of the classes where, the, where there's more re, a remediation approach rather than a rigor approach. That tracking thing can be insidious and Jeannie Oakes and many other scholars have been writing about this for decades um, there may be lawsuits that could be coming up through the system at some point about um, equal access to educational opportunities and whether tracking is actually facilitating a disproportionate impact. I think it's a real area of focus right now. If we think about our early warning systems, what percentage of our kids who are dropping out, who are chronically absent, are in lower track classes. If you're seeing that proportion in your data, rather than try to fix the problem in the student, the problem may be fixable by just simply making heterogeneously grouped classes. Um, it's long been identified as a primary driver of school push out and drop out and attendance problems. It segregates kids, it reinforces privilege and it perpetuates disadvantage. Um, it, any of us who wanna be honest about it, if we really wanna look at the data, well, I think that's what we, how we have to conclude. So what do you do? You detrack your school. It can be done because it has been done. You can find them online, talk to them, do a site visit, see what they did it, find out what their journey was, and then reproduce that at your school. 
Um, another solution is to establish competency-based education in your school. It's a great way to detrack classrooms and whole content areas, whole departments. It's also a fantastic way to get much better data about where your kids are and how do I target specific supports. If one student is really struggling with this competency, but he's sitting right next to a student who's really not or is really great at that particular competency and there might be some great opportunities for students to share resources you can make the classroom a fantastic place of inquiry and inter-peer help there that wouldn't be possible in traditional tracked environments and last solution here is to use student-centered learning research and community outreach to prepare for the inevitable blowback when teachers when excuse me when families and whole communities are used to getting the privileges of having their students in the higher track classes, there will be blowback about, well, why should my kid have to sit with those kids when you're just gonna have to dumb down learning? Use competency-based and student-centered learning personalized techniques, and we can show through evidence that we're not actually dumbing down learning, we're raising all boats when that tide goes up in this way, and the research would support that, and so would the techniques. But really thinking about using the student-centered learning and prepare a communications campaign to, to, for, to deal with the inevitable blowback that you will get when you move to detracking. But I can't stress enough, tracking is toxic. Next thing to think about, a feature you might want to scrutinize to your early warning system is exclusionary discipline. Um, we know that the uh, Dear Colleague letter from 2014 was a pretty big, momentous event from the Department of Education several years ago, and that there's been some recent retreats from that. Um, the data are pretty clear um, that punishment and ostracism, however, continue to be poor strategies to reform individual and collective student behaviors. They, they don't work over the long term, and they tend to actually exacerbate student students' disconnection and alienation from schools. So if we're seeking to bring kids into the fold to keep them in school, why would we use exclusionary disciplinary tactics? Um, racial and socioeconomic status tend to have uh, uh, have been disproportionately and amply demonstrated in the outcomes and outputs from exclusionary disciplinary practices. We know that it's discriminatory. We know that there are easy fixes for it. We know that there's longer term fixes for it, and we'll talk about some of those, but that it needs to be fixed is, is, is absolutely clear in the data. Um, and we also know that school safety, um, all the way from fights to uh, retribution, to bullying and everything, um, even to the possibility of there being uh, uh, more um, um, harmful and weapons-based forms of violence. But all of those potentialities can be enhanced when retribution in school discipline is replaced with restoration. And so therefore, one solution I would offer is using restorative practices and a coupling that with the necessary long game view of school-wide trainings in order to move up to those. If you just have three or four classes at your school that are using restorative practices, but they're not school-wide, the impact will be minor, if at all. But if you do a school-wide thing and say we're committing to three years of PD, and we're gonna have a five-year plan for doing it, and this is what it's gonna look like, and this is how we're gonna support each other, and we're gonna work with parents and community members and students to develop these and tweak them and make them more and more responsive, you will get there, and the impact will be hard to overestimate, particularly as you think about kids who already are alienated and are chronically absent. Many of those kids tend to be the ones who are um, most likely to misbehave, quote unquote, misbehave in school, um, and to be uh, suspended or um, expelled. So using restorative practices is a way to hold them accountable for their behavior, but also keep them in the fold and keep them connected to the relationships that will most help them flourish. And the last part, I would say the solution here is to look into positive behavioral, behavioral intervention and support programs, but to make sure that in designing those programs that you include multiple stakeholder checks. There are far too many schools and systems and districts out there who have used PBIS in ways that actually just kind of recreate the wheel where You've got punishment systems and exclusionary systems and sort of tier three responses still is suspension and expulsion. Like PBIS, when it's done really well, actually has multiple opportunities for restorative practices and much better engagement with students early on rather than waiting until it gets to be a big problem. But too often those, those PBIS systems are sort of put into the bricks and mortar of schools and they, they just become part of the old bricks and mortar. So including stakeholder checks, parents, particularly marginalized and minoritized um, parents, um, including them as stakeholders, as you design and think about the impact is a really key component. Thinking about school culture here, a couple of quick insights and then we'll move to some Q&A here uh, toward the end. Um, school culture drives so much of what we're able to achieve in schools. Uh, the messages we send to kids, the beliefs that we hold about kids, 
um, what we think is possible in schools. Um, our adult beliefs and expectations really drive our student outcomes. So think about the messages that you're sending in your brochure, on your website, in the posters that you hang in your classroom, in the sign over the door as kids enter school every day, and the stuff that you put in the homework, at the quotes that are in classrooms. Do an inventory. Check your school. See what kind of stuff is around that school. What might need to change? For an example, like all children can learn. I am not a fan of that statement, and I would argue that you shouldn't be either. All children can learn is sort of a hedged bet. You're sort of saying all children can learn, and the subset or the subtext there is, but some will choose not to, or some won't, or some just were going to fall by the wayside. Instead of saying something that's radically affirmative, which is everyone learns here which is a very different kinds of statement, and it's a much more faithful, affirming thing. It also positions the teachers and the leaders and the paraprofessionals, your, your district administrators are all learning to become better at the work that they do, which is a much more kind of learner-centered approach. Another example, saying to students, be respectful. That You can't base a norm on a contested term. Your version of respect might look very different than what my version of respect looks like, looks like, and it might look really different from this student versus that student, this family versus that family, this community versus that community. So telling people to be respectful without being really clear about what you mean actually creates opportunities for social and racial dominance in the classroom. Instead, have a more affirming statement like, we lift as we rise. And then you can say to a student, no, you're not lifting right there. You're actually pushing down. That's not how we talk to each other in here. Instead of you're not being respectful, which doesn't say anything. We need to lift. What's a better way that you can do that, that you might be able to lift your partner in the classroom rather than as you rise up, as you get better? How can we bring others with us? Um, you know, saying Joey's a hands-on learner is not a good way to frame how, what Joey's capacity is and potential. You're closing doors for Joey instead of, in, in, instead of engaging Joey and saying, what strategy are you using here? What's another strategy you might, you might use? We're constantly communicating these messages to our students, and I've got these ones color-coded, like this student doesn't want to learn horrible thing to say about a student or to a student versus saying this student is disengaged a little bit better we're getting we're on our way there we might be at paying attention to cultural and and uh, school culture factors and contextual factors versus saying this student is experiencing a disengaging context even better and the best you might be able to say there is this student has not yet been effectively engaged the transition from those four sentences even though they seem to convey the same thing very different messaging and very different ways that those messages are going to be received by your stakeholders, your students, your peers, your parents, your leaders in your schools. So a solution, do a messaging inventory with students and parents. Walk around the school and record all the messages that you like, that you have questions about, and you think ought to be removed, and have a conversation about that with students and with parents and with folks involved. Um, establish uh, critical friends groups and professional learning community reading groups and focus on issues like school culture or tracking or whiteness or um, early warning system components, whatever you might want to focus on. But getting those peer groups reading the same things and talking to each other about them is a great strategy for reform. Using improvement science methods and rapid cycle prototyping, this is a really hot thing in, teach in uh, education right now. Highly recommend that schools start learn how to do this. It really can have an amazing impact in a short amount of time and do really good things for faculty. To that end, I can't recommend enough the book Learning to Improve learning to improve how america's schools can get better at getting better by tony bright anthony bright b-r-y-k it's published by harvard education press a couple years ago um, and the carnegie foundation has done some fantastic work in supporting improvement science it's a way to get teachers and students and communities to ask questions about how they're serving students needs to try things out over short cycles and to improve them and then to tell people about it it's a really cool thing highly recommend it and the last thing, and this is hard, every principal, every district level leader will nod their head with this one. Sometimes we have to be brave enough to have the woodshed conversations with the laggards. And that means working with unions like Montgomery County and out in, uh, um, in um, Baltimore and many other districts have done around the country is to have those really difficult conversations that push educators who are part of the problem out of the profession and gathering data on them and working with unions to make sure that we're not protecting the bad teachers, but using unions as a lever to make sure that they're understanding their work as a building a profession and lots of unions and districts have done that work with just beautiful results. Again, I would highlight Montgomery uh, County Schools in Maryland. Um, 
faculty diversity, don't need to say too much about this. It's pretty obvious. Um, our students are now, I believe, majority minority. Uh, we're moving towards that as a country, uh, but I think we're already there with our schools. Most of our students are um, um, black, brown, or come from, or have Asian, um, um, South or Central American, um, African um, roots. And most of our teachers are actually white and middle class. And we need to understand that for many of our students, our teachers are understood as mirrors. And if they don't see themselves reflected in their teachers, that may mean that they feel that school doesn't represent them or represent them or for them. And so that means we need to mentor, we need to relate, we need to teach in ways that are strengthened by our cultural responsiveness. And that means we need to look for more and more teachers who are capable of doing that work because they arrive already understanding some of the kids who are most marginalized because they were the those kids. Um, some solutions would be to work with your district to bolster targeted recruitments and supports, to build cohorts of paraprofessionals, even high school students, to plug those leaks in the pipeline. Look into grow your own teacher education programs. There's been legislation that has been passed in multiple states, South Carolina, Illinois, Arizona, and some other states have led the way. There's fantastic curriculum programs and scholarships and post-secondary uh, and workforce development programs out there that have really done really amazing jobs of growing teachers locally and supplying their own, whether it's focusing on high school kids, college kids, or paraprofessionals, um, really, really great outputs from that. And then last, trying to do trainings and focus on doing trainings that target anti-oppressive strategies and interrogating whiteness, that that will make fertile the ground for when uh, teachers arrive at our sites who are already minoritized and marginalized, they'll find the area much more fertile for their um, critical work with the populations who are already marginalized and minoritized. So conclusions here, chronic absenteeism is a symptom. We need to ask really brave questions about what the underlying problems might be. And in some cases, those problems are what we choose to do and how we choose to do it in our schools, in our classrooms, and in our systems. Our early warning systems really therefore need to scrutinize the assumptions the practices and the procedures that we've established for our students. If we're only focusing on the problems with kids and families, we're probably dealing way too much with many of the symptoms. We're not getting to the core problems. Of course, we cannot, we're schools, we cannot necessarily deal with problems in housing, with work, with job training, with opioid addiction, with um, uh, post-incarceration infusion in communities with transportation issues, those aren't our responsibilities. Our responsibility is to build and sustain systems that will not work against our efforts to address chronic absenteeism, and we can fix those, and we need to fix those, but that means we need to be brave and look about, uh, look around at the stuff that we're doing, not just look at the kids who aren't, or who aren't showing up to school. Um, if we want students to expect, accept responsibility for their actions, we should be demonstrating that we can do that too. And that means taking charge of the stuff that we can fix, and that means it's the stuff that we do and the stuff that we, um, that we see others do. Um, we need to admit that we're really, and this isn't that fun, but there's a good part to it, we're, that we're not innocent in this, we're often complicit in it. The good news is that that means actually we can change. If we know that we're a part of the problem, then we've identified the actual thing that needs to change, and that means we don't have to search anymore, we can change that one thing. Um, we need to admit that schools tend to pick favorites. They don't often function as meritocracies, they actually function in the opposite, as ranking and sorting mechanisms. And the good news is that we know that we need to change that. The decision is whether we have the guts and the will and the political savvy to actually do that. And then the last part I will say is, and this, I learned this from a, a principal in Portland, Oregon, where at the end of every faculty meeting, he would just say to his teachers, stay curious. And I love that message because it means that if we are curious, we will consult researchers, we'll consult research, we'll ask stakeholders how we're doing, um, we'll then listen to that, and then we'll get better. And the more we do that, the more we take that orientation, uh, the more I trust that, w that we um, actually will. So um, I'll conclude there, and then I'll start to field some questions here um, from the chat. So let's see, I need to hand the thing back to Veronica. Veronica, could you tell me real quick how I hand the back to you? Sure, so if you, if you just um, right click on Dantel's name, it will say uh, change Perfect. role two. You can make Got it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. Great information. Um, so yes, if um, we only have maybe six or seven folks um, still remaining, so what I think I can do is um, everybody, ev all attendees are inherently muted, but I can make everyone a panelist so that it unmutes everybody, and then you can submit. Um, you can just ask questions, you know, 
um, through audio rather than having to submit them um, through the chat function. So I'm going to go ahead and do that quick. That's great. To make great. everyone a panelist. Um, so yes, yeah, so everyone should be able to mute and unmute themselves now. Just make sure that um, you're unmuted both on your telephone or your computer and then also um, through the WebEx platform. Um, and you can feel free to ask questions to Dr. Sushalis, or you can still submit them through the chat function as well. Um, we didn't have any questions come in throughout the presentation, but certainly, folks, if you have questions now, we have a few minutes and are willing to respond to those. I'm good with wait time, people. I'm a teacher. Come on now. <laughs> Don't make it start calling on people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I am also going to um, send out to everyone the URL for the National TA Center's temporary webpage where this webinar recording and all of the recordings from all of our previous webinars, along with all materials from our national convenings, are held. Um, you can find you know, PowerPoint presentations and handouts and all types of, of really great resources related to early warning systems and success mentors on that website. Um, and again, just sort of be on the lookout for a, a national announcement about the launch of our full technical assistance center, which should be coming within the next couple of weeks. All right, and we did have a comment come in, Eric, and I don't Great. think you can see it. I think it came directly to me. So it says, no real questions. However, I thank you for the great information. I work in a very progressive two-year college that uses as an, and is incorporating many of these concepts. Looking forward to more discussions like this at JFS next week. Thank you for attending questions. Nice. <laughs> Our challenge is helping a very large school district to see the benefit of this. Terrific, yeah. I, I, scaling up the kinds of things that I'm suggesting to at that large systemic level, um, the first response for many folks when you talk about sort of the dismantling um, aspects of what I'm suggesting is often fear and we can't do that or that'll never float there. And stay, my recommendation would be stay in that conversation. Ask them what they're afraid of. What, what is their worst case scenario? Have them map that out for you. And then pick away at each one of those fears and show that, well, yeah, in one year you're not going to get there and you are going to get this blowback and it is going to be tough. What are ways you can compensate for that? What if you took a three-year view? What if you took a five-year view? Like not starting because you're afraid is really saying, I'd prefer the status quo. And really getting people to break down what they're scared of is often a way of just putting them in the room and they can feel like some agency in deciding to, to move against it. And so, you know, honor people's fears where they're at, but keep pushing. Love it. Great. All right. Um, Maureen, again, common agreed. We are in it for the long haul with them, exclamation mark. <laughs> right on. Yeah, it's, it's long and difficult work. And again, where, where it's possible to bring um, stakeholders to the table as partners, um, as evaluators, and by stakeholders, I mean the, the, the families of minoritized and marginalized kids. Um, they, they need to be at the, those kids need to be at the table wherever it's possible and whether it makes sense. Um, bring in business owners so they can see the kind of stuff that you're working for. When you get the Chamber of Commerce behind the reforms that you're making because they know they're going to get better employees and better citizens out of it, you've got a strong voice in the classroom or in your system level mm -hmm. reforms that will help you kind of keep that, mo that, that ball rolling. But bring stakeholders to the table. It's really important that it, we don't just have our own echo chambers. All right, so well, last call for comments or questions. Um, and I want to take a moment to thank you, Eric, um, for all of the, the great information in today's webinar. Um, and we, we definitely hope that all of you will join us again for a future webinar. We have about five or six of these left um, before the end of September. So um, while you're on the temporary website, just go ahead and take a look at some of the other webinars that we have scheduled uh, between now and the end of September and see if there's any you'd like to register for. 
Um, and with that, I think we will call it a day. And again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Eric. Um, we hope to see you all again on a future webinar. Thank you, Veronica. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.